NC State football is headed out west on Saturday, and it's time to answer the question, who's hungrier, a pack of wolves or a pack of bears? You are Locked On Wolf Pack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolf Pack, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Wolfpack Nation? It's time to get locked in with Locked On. Thanks for making Locked On Wolfpack your first listen each and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Our Friday intro sponsor is FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed. Head on over to FanDuel.com in order to get started. Happy Friday to all. As always, I'm Grayson Boone, joined by former Wolfpack defensive tackle Kenton Gibbs. Kenton, the NC State Wolfpack are headed out west to take on the Golden Bears of Cal on Saturday. 3.30 Eastern time kickoff out there in Cal. Both teams are currently 3-3. Both teams are currently winless in the ACC. What will it take for NC State to pick up win number one in ACC play? Well, we have the keys. All righty. So in terms of Ken's keys for this week, we talked about this earlier this week, but when I think of the keys for this team to win, right, I had to throw out my conventional thinking because normally I try to keep the keys to something that is that I'm like, oh, that's super feasible. And like we could get that done. And I'm pretty sure we will get that done if we're a serious team this week. However, this time I want somebody to play out of their mind. And that somebody is our signal caller. RQB1, CJ Bailey. In the words of in the words of Key Sweat, you may be young, but you're ready. It is time for CJ Bailey to have himself a masterclass. And of course, this goes with the offensive line protecting them. Of course, this goes with the run, run game being good enough to keep them in good positions. But I want to see CJ Bailey get it done. I want 300 total yards. I want two touchdowns. I want zero. Zilch. Nada in terms of turnovers. I know some of y'all are going to look at me like I'm crazy and say, Ken, this is one of the best teams that are taking the ball away in the nation. But that is why this is a key. I want to see how well Cal can drive long fields. I want to see how well Cal can make it happen, even though Newcastle's had a couple off games, right? Ever since that one game where it was, what was it, uh, 398 punny yards or 298, whatever it was, Eight punts, seven down inside the 20. He's been a little off. He's been up and down, and, you know, he's resembled the rest of this team to, to some extent. That's not to say that he's still not a fantastic punter, but I want to make that team drive long fields over and over and over again. And if Mendoza and company can get it done consistently, you live with that. But I need C.J. Bailey to be a guy that's like, you know what? Being good for a freshman ain't enough. I want to be good, period. I want to put on something special, period, in this game. Yeah, we've talked about C.J. Bailey getting incrementally better every single week that he's been out there so far. If he's going to go on the road and beat this Cal team that has a very stingy defense, he's going to have to outdo his performance that he gave us last week against Syracuse. And that's the number one thing you want to see from C.J., just get a little bit better every single week. But this week, to beat Cal, you have to put together probably your best performance yet. Offensive key number two. Offensive key number two is to smother the defense. You see what I did there? Hollywood Smothers needs at least 12 touches. Here's the thing, right? I Even if I'm being as empathetic as possible and saying, hey, it's hard to get Joe Lee the ball because not only is he a tight end, but teams can double the middle of the field a lot easier than they can the outside. That is a much tougher uh, ordeal to kind of handle there. But Hollywood Smothers is a running back. He is your RB1. Grace and I have said this for quite some time. We we know he was injured, y'all. We know. We get it. Lots of people have told us he was injured. That's why he wasn't getting the touches. I vehemently disagree. There were games where he was available, where he just didn't get as many touches as I would have liked. But he's back. He's getting back healthy. He's getting back right. He looked healthy to you in the last game, didn't he, Grace? Very healthy. He looked very healthy, okay? Good and healthy. So with that being said, Ride your lead horses to victory out there against, by the way, a pack of bears is called a sloth. Get your get your best horses out against the whole sloth of bears. You need Hollywood Smothers to have at least 12 touches. 
I'm going to choose to continue to call him a pack of bears because a sloth does not make any sense. <laughs> However, Hollywood Smothers last week, for comparison, he had seven total touches. He had four rushes and three receptions. Bump those numbers up. To compete against Cal, get the ball into the hands of your best playmakers. And yes, we've talked a lot about that being Justin Jolie, but once you get Hollywood Smothers back in the rotation like we saw last week, as soon as he's on the field, he makes a visual impact in this offense. We need to get the ball in his hands as often as we can in this game. 12 plus touches, if not more, the more the merrier in this case. In our third and final offensive key. Score points on 60% of all trips in the plus territory. If we had gotten points on 60% of our trips in the plus territory last game, that is basically if you get three points on 60%, how many points would that have been? Well, we know the answer to that. That we got into the we got into plus territory against uh Syracuse. What was it six times or so? I believe it was five. Okay, five times. One resulted in a touchdown. And what did the other four result in? Three turnovers and a missed field goal. Okay, so if you get points on 60% there, what's 60% of the five, Grayson? Three. Okay. The least amount of points the offense can get is how many points, Grayson? Three. If we're doing three times three, right? Three squared, as some would say. What's the answer to that? That'd be nine. I know y'all are thinking we're doing a lot of math. Make your head hurt. Don't worry. We're going to get past this in just a second. Did we lose the game by more or less than nine? We lost the game by less than nine. Okay. So if you are scoring when you're getting into plus territory, right? You cannot just be amazing between the 20s. When you are at that point or between the 30s, when you are at that point where the line of delineation happens for you to go make something big happen, something special happen to get in the end zone, you've got to do it. You've just got to. And honestly, I feel bad for even saying that's something bigger special because that's something that should be a given. That's something that should be, hey, we got it in, at their 30 or deeper, automatic points. Go ahead and book it now. Brought up exactly because of how last week went. When you go over into plus territory, and not only do you not score, but to turn the ball over three times in crucial spots of that game, it simply cannot happen. It couldn't happen against Syracuse, and I can assure you that it will do you no good to do it on the road against Cal as well. So if you're getting into plus territory or even deeper into the red zone, you have to find a way to come away with points. Or at the absolute minimum, don't turn the ball over. I can live with an arm punt, so to speak, or you get across the 50 and you stall out there. Just don't turn the ball over when you have so much momentum already built on some of those drives. The three drives that we ended up turning the ball over were probably the three best drives of the night. And I think that's why that really just felt like you took a dagger to the gut because it's just instant momentum ripped away from you. So not only do you have to get into plus territory, finish the job once you get over there. So 60 plus on all trips into plus territory. Now switching gears over to the defense and special teams. Finish the game with a plus two or better turnover margin. This is the best team in the nation in terms, or one of the best teams in the nation in terms of taking the ball away and not giving it away. But here's the thing. If you can create a situation where you force Mendoza into bad mistakes, where the defensive backfield shows up in a major way, create some turnovers, you're going to put yourself in a very good position because you're going to put yourself in that plus field situation. You're going to put yourself in positive situations in terms of we don't have to go a long way. So if we get 50 yards, we're in the end zone. We're dancing. We're having a great old time out there in Berkeley. Not we went 50 yards and we're still at the 20. You know, so uh, finish the game with a plus two turnover margin is definitely something necessary. You can't beat other teams if you're busy wrapped up beating yourself. Don't yeah. turn the ball over in this game. And if you can, make sure you're forcing turnovers on the defense. We learned that the hard way last week against Syracuse. Cannot afford to do it again this week against Cal. Defensive key number two. Hold Fernando Mendoza to a QBR of 50 or less. 50 means average. 50 is perfectly average for a QBR, by the way. The QBR is different from quarterback rating in terms of, or passer rating in terms of what you think where the numbers like normally, if a player has a really good game, 119 something or 100, two different things. This scale is zero to 100. If you can hold him to just average, make him average, no better, no worse. You've got a really good shot at this thing. And I understand that Wilcox doesn't win games. Wilcox and the Bears don't win games via an extremely high-powered offense. They win it 
by just suffocating you, suffocating you, suffocating you. But with that being said, again, you cannot let Mendoza show up in a meaningful way and dominate early or else you're going to have problems. You're going to have a ton of problems in winning this game. Mendoza is a good quarterback, but he's not a great quarterback. He can make all the plays. He's not really going to do anything spectacular that will tip this game one way or another. Don't help him out. If you get into the backfield and you make his life a lot more difficult than it should be, then yes, that is your opportunity for the defense to feed on. If you're not able to get any pressure and perhaps he's able to escape the pocket and prolong a drive that's keeping your defense on the field, that is how you get worn down to the point where Cal will that's break it. you and then you ended up losing this game. So don't help him out. He doesn't need any help. Make his life difficult and force pressure on him all day long. And our third and final defensive key? Less than 10 missed tackles. Here's the deal. Cal not only has Jay Knott, they have multiple skill position players that if you let them, they will party in the end zone all night long, not because they're these super athletes that is like, hey, that guy, if he's even, he's leaving. So is the same case for this guy. So is the same case for this guy. But they do have guys that are tough to bring down. That Again, if you're in a rock fight, they can make it gritty. They can make it ugly. They can make it nasty and find a way to win. And one of the biggest ways to win that rock fight, break a tackle or two. Break a tackle or two in real tough situations. But if you hold, if you are averaging less than two and a half missed tackles per quarter, you'll be just fine in this game. If guys are being wrapped up and bought to the ground, you'll be just fine. And I say this as a key, not because of who, uh, not because of who Cal is, because of who NC State has been all season, right? How many times against Syracuse it, was it a case where it's like, man, if you bring him down right there, we're good. You get off the field. And then the guy just breaks the tackle, goes a little bit longer, something like that. How many times did we see that? You know, we saw a miss sack on, uh, we saw a miss sack on Kyle McCord by Sean Brown that basically ended up giving him a touchdown there because, I mean, he was able to step up evade Sean and hit a hit a pretty good pass there. So, I mean, less than 10 missed tackles has to be a key. Cal, despite their record and despite, you know, previous indications of Cal football, they're a very physical football team. Jade Knott, he's a great running back. Javian Thomas, great running back. Mendoza himself is a quarterback, really tough quarterback. If you cannot finish a tackle and finish a drive and get off of the field, you're going to run into the same issues you saw against Wake Forest, the same issues you saw against Syracuse. Finish the tackle, finish the job, and get off the field. Coming up next, we're getting into Fan Friday, addressing our top comments of the week. This comes after a quick word from our sponsors. Our first Friday sponsor is Hims. Your sex life is important, but your schedule is busy. You don't have the time to go to a doctor's office and get treated for ED. Through Hims, you can get a personalized ED treatment without ever having to step foot outside of your door. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you with access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. The process is 100% online, so there's no need for uncomfortable doctor's visits. You just answer a series of questions on their site, and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option for you. If prescribed, your medication ships directly to you in discreet packaging for free. No insurance is needed, and one low price covers everything from treatments to ongoing care. With hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers, Hims can help you find the ED option that truly works for you. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash locked on. That's H I M S dot com slash locked on, L O C K E D O N, for your personalized ED treatment options. Hymns.com slash locked on. The products mentioned are chewable compounded products which are not approved by or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. Middle portion of our Friday show. It's now time for Fan Friday, addressing our top comments of the week. Here we go. First one comes from NC State alum on YouTube. They say, we need a new OC and maybe a new O-line coach. Although, we've been having a lot of good offensive tackle and interior offensive lineman recruits commit recently. Looks like we're finally taking that position seriously. So, I think a couple weeks back, I mentioned this on a hump day hot take, that I needed to see something from Robert and I. 
a lot of people want to talk about Dave Dorn and how he should be fired and he'd be doing us a service if he steps away. I want to be very clear about something. Dave Dorn is not going anywhere. The only way that he is not back next year is if he retires. And I don't anticipate that happening. So I think what may happen, or at least is possibly more likely to happen, is that some of the assistant coaches are potentially replaced. I think Robert and I could be on a short list for guys that their job may be in jeopardy. Now, I'm not necessarily calling for his job, but with how disappointing this season has gone, changes obviously have to be made. Something has to be changed because you can't afford to just take this product and just hope it'll go differently next year. So if you're looking at changes to be made, I wouldn't necessarily be surprised that some of the assistant coaches are the ones being changed. Yeah, I definitely feel where you're going there. I mean, like you said, Dorn is not going anywhere. The money is is too intense in terms of a buyout and all that for NC State to stomach that and then have to pay a new coach and all that. And, you know, you talked about, hey, there may be changes and the offense may see those changes and all that about recruiting. But I want to talk about that last sentence uh, for a second. It looks like we're finally taking that position seriously in terms of offensive line. And since we're talking about Benz's, I'm going to quote a big body Benz of my own. No disrespect. I don't mean that as a derogatory term with Lizzo. And it's about damn time, right? It's about damn time that you take the trenches seriously. It's about damn time that you get high level players there because at the end of the day, offensively and defensively, your big men will always, always, always lead on the best defenses. Your big men set the tone. Your big men make it all possible to happen behind them. The saying is a good front end will affect the back end before a good back end affects the front end. If you can effectively stop the run, if you can effectively rest the passer with three to four guys, that does much more for you than having guys that can plaster for three, four seconds. Because even if you have guys that can do that, if your defensive line ain't worth nothing, guess what? We have seen it already this year. Not saying that the D-line is it ain't about nothing, but I'm saying there have been times where we put on the three-man rush against a um, against a quarterback who or against a receiver core where they weren't able to get open immediately. But because we were rushing three on five and we couldn't get any pressure, the quarterback was able to sit back there, make a sandwich, compare insurance quotes, see if he could save more money with Geico, call his girlfriend and his side piece up, and then, you know, go ahead and maybe give his life to Christ, get baptized or something, then throw the ball and find somebody open. We cannot, and, and this isn't, you know, an indictment of the defense. This is just talking about big fellas in general. Your big guys will always set the tone because if you can block, if you can do what you need to do up front, you will have a good offense and at least decent offense regardless. Your quarterback can be dog water in college. If you have – a good running game due to an offensive line, if you have a situation where your quarterback gets to sit back there and play patty cake, burp the baby for a little while before he gets rid of it, you'll have a better situation than otherwise. And I'll say this also in terms of recruiting by Coach 2J. I would encourage folks to go look at all of the recruits and commitments that he's gotten in the last like two years. The sheer size of some of these kids that he has signed to come to NC State now, again, now size does not equal success, but you can tell there's been a philosophy shift in the type of interior offensive lineman they're going after. We're talking mooses or meese, whatever the plural of moose is. These are big old boys. And that's something we've kind of lacked here at NC State. And I think that also goes hand in hand with the run game struggles that we've experienced. Size doesn't equal success, but when you have houses on your offensive line, I tend to think that you're going to experience a lot more success on the ground. So my personal jury is kind of still out on 2J. I think he gets maybe like three to four years before I start to really judge his body of work. I'm a lot right. more critical of an, of an eye because the scheme issues, that's been a lot more of the problem. But I am interested to see how 2J's recruits uh, start to develop here at NC State. Second one here comes from Carla Jenkins on Twitter. She says, how will NC State's defense stop Jaden Knott and get quarterback pressure? I mean, I think the key starts up front. I think the guys up front have to be dominant. The linebackers have to fill holes properly and run good dog tracks. I think that those are the two things that are going to mean the most in terms of this game because we have seen time and time and time again, even on the touchdown against Wake Forest, where it was an inside zone split with some motion on it, the defensive line 
if we just judge by how they did, they blew the play up and forced it. There was nothing that back could have done, even on his best day, to say, I'm going to go front side here. Grayson and I talked about the fact that they blew up the play so indubitably, there was a linebacker that went free and untouched if he wanted to, uh, you know, take a, take a shot in terms of, oh, well, I guess all these holes are, are clogged up. Let me go ahead and see what's going on over here since I have nowhere to be. If if we are talking about, you know, what that looks like, that's great and all. But again, it's incumbent upon the linebackers to help out here. And at 335 in an aggressive blitzing scheme, your linebackers are going to have to carry a good chunk of the load in terms of stopping the run and generating that QB pressure. So they're going to need to do it here. The run fits have been a massive problem for this defense for the majority of the season. And that's why we have been gashed by teams like Clemson or tennis, or even recently like Wake Forest. We had certainly not been expecting Wake Forest to run for however many yards it was. It was way too many. When you can't consistently fill your assignment as a linebacker or a player in the secondary also for that matter, teams are going to be able to pick you apart on the ground before they even try you through the air. So Jaden Knott, he is one of the more talented running backs in the ACC. He has certainly been injured for a lot of this season, and we don't really know what version of Jaden Ott we may or may not see on Saturday. But assuming he's healthy, we'll go ahead and assume that he's healthy. You have got to be disciplined against a guy like this. And not just that, finish the tackle, which is something we talked about as our third defensive key. If you can't bring this guy down on your second or third try, he's going to keep going. And if he gets through you, he's headed to the end zone. So the discipline of the linebacking play on Saturday, that will be what tells me how much success we're going to have against. If you can't successfully fill the gaps and take down Jaden Ott, they're going to be able to get whatever they want. So that's basically where that story is headed. Next one comes from Boutique Hunter on YouTube. They say, we will not have to worry about winning a bowl game this year. It's week eight, and we have yet to beat a Power 4 team. Hard for me to sit here and say we're going to make a bowl. Sad for year 12. I don't know what to say about that comment other than it's accurate. I mean, you know, you're you're talking about a situation where you're saying, hey, we haven't beat a Power 4 team all year, and that's absolutely right. I'm not giving you any pushback, not giving you any disagreement there. Cal has done that in terms of beating Auburn and whatnot. But I will say this. At the end of the day, this is the reason I said every single game has to be the most important. You have to play every game as if it's your Super Bowl. Every game with the passion and anger and fire in your heart like you're playing the Dirty Foot Club. You have to because without it, I'm not sure if this team goes to a bowl game. I'm not sure. I really and truly am not. I would love to say, hey, I know NC State is going to a bowl game. I know in my heart of hearts, there is no way that this team misses out on a bowl game. However, we've seen it. We've seen it already this year, right? If you use the if you use the whole transference thing of, oh, this team did this against this team and this team did that against that team, it's so insane to think Virginia came back and beat Wake Forest, and yet we couldn't. And yet if we play Virginia, it feels like, even though it probably shouldn't be the case, we might be favored in that game. So I I am very much so at a point with this team where I'm like, every single game has to be your best. Every single game has to be something special. You have to be able to put on a performance that will get you a win because at the end of the day, a lot like I said after game two, ACC championship shouldn't, be talked about it should be next game up that's how i feel right now bowl game shouldn't be talked about it the only things you be talked about beat cap that's it yeah and this also kind of goes hand in hand with what i was talking about my big picture takeaway on monday i really don't care about making or not making a bowl game at this point of the season big picture goals for the season have been long gone you wanted to play for an acc championship and you wanted to win 10 games that is very far off of the table so everything else in my opinion It just doesn't really matter. If we make a bowl and win it, does anyone feel great about it? No. You're six and six and you win some mediocre bowl game. Would we really feel great about that? I think the answer across the board is more than likely no. And so that's why on Monday I was talking about the only thing that that matters to me from here on out is the players getting better. The player development from your young quarterback and your young wide receivers and some of the key pieces that you want to bring back next year on defense That is the only thing that I'm looking for. Because at this point in my mind, there's really not a difference between five and seven or seven and five. I know there's a difference between a winning and losing record, but it would all just feel the same to me. Five and seven, six and six, and seven and five. 
it would all feel very similar. I'd feel the exact same hollow feeling that I currently still have. And bowl or no bowl, I just don't care at this point. I just want to see the players get better. That's the only thing that matters for the rest of this season and going into next season. And last one here from Taxi Batman on Twitter. He says, Tony Bennett's retirement shakes up the ACC a great deal. What does it mean for us? I think it opens things up for us to move up in the conference and be a more consistent program. Would love to know your thoughts. So yes, Virginia head basketball coach Tony Bennett retires very suddenly on Thursday. I was certainly not expecting this, and I think most people, it kind of came out of the blue. Now, people have dug up previous comments made by Tony Bennett like the last couple of years, and it sort of hinted at him wanting to you know, dip his toe into retirement somewhat soon. But for it to come on a random Thursday, and you're what, I don't know, three weeks out from starting the season, that is what is bizarre to me. They just had ACC Media Day for basketball. Uh, I think it was last week in Charlotte. Tony Bennett was there. And not just that, yeah. Tony Bennett also, he just signed an extension over the summer that extended his contract out to 2030. So if in June, he was thinking, yeah, I'm probably still going to be here until 2030. And then fast forward to the middle of October and he's hanging them up. That's a very abrupt shift. And he certainly cited all the differences and the changes in the world of college sports. And I think he even said that it's just not in a healthy spot right now. I don't necessarily disagree, but my biggest, I don't even want to call it a gripe, but my biggest concern is for his team. And I know this is not a UVA podcast. This is an NC State podcast, but I kind of feel for the team. You lose your head coach three weeks before this thing tips off. But on the NC State side of things, I don't really know what to expect from UVA this year now. I would assume they'll probably be the same-ish team with or without Tony Bennett. But for Kevin Keats, this new world, you come back from winning an ACC championship and you go to the Final Four, you got to continue to capitalize on that. And if more coaches like Tony Bennett, who have been historically great in the ACC, begin to start to step away, you have to capitalize on that. So this may or may not be a good thing for NC State in the short term, but long term, you certainly hope that Keats can capitalize. Grayson, I don't give a damn about none of that. Honestly, uh, more power to him. Hey, I'm sad to see you go, but this this comment is right on in terms of, you know, this potentially making this team more consistent. I talked about it before in terms of K is gone, Roy is gone, and now Tony Bennett's gone. NC State continue to do your thing. Yes, the timing is insane. I, I think – it's not only insane, it's downright a little bit rude. It ain't yeah. my day. I am not a who. You know what I mean? That is none of my business. That is none of my concern. Kevin Keats and this team absolutely have that opportunity. Remember what I said years ago and everybody said, oh, oh, oh look at how stupid you sound, you anime nerd, when I said, this is the Sozin's Comet moment. This is the moment for NC State to, hey, remember, if you're an Avatar fan, when the Fire Nation decided to attack, it was because there was a comet in the sky that increased their powers, ladies and gentlemen. Guess what? All of these coaches retiring at the same time? That's what that is. Take a wild guess. The Fire Nation also wore red. Just, just saying. I'm not saying, but I'm saying it is your time to attack Keats. It is your time to take NC State back to perennial relevance in terms of basketball. It is your time to make the NCAA try to find new things to come up with to take down this to take down this NC State basketball team because Lord knows it's coming if all of a sudden we usurp both of the, the blues in, in the triangle and become not only relevant to, hey, this is who we are on a regular basis, but perhaps the premier brand of the three. Lord knows what would happen. I'm not guaranteeing it happens. I'm not saying it's going to happen. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But I'm saying the opportunity is there. The chance is there. For people who don't like either one of those teams anymore in the state of North Carolina, you don't got to go up to UVA no more to play you some good ball. You know, and all for all the pack line defense is, outside of one natty, didn't have as much success as Keats, not did he, in terms of the tournament. I did it. So, uh, in all seriousness, Coach Keats, it, it, it's his time. It's his time to do something special. Can't afford to let all these historic coaches step away and not kind of jump up to get in their spot where they were and take advantage of the changing landscape. 
the opportunity is now even bigger for Coach Keats to capitalize on last year's run. Certainly looking to see how he does that here in just a few short weeks. Coming up next, we're going to give our final pregame thoughts and predictions ahead of tomorrow's matchup. This comes after a quick word from our sponsors. Our second Friday sponsor is FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the very same page that you're placing all of your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place just your first $5 bet on the app. NC State is a 10 and a half point underdog out in Cal on Saturday afternoon. If you think NC State will cover, waste no more time. Head on over to fanduel.com in order to get started. Last couple minutes of our Friday show. Now, time for our final pregame thoughts and predictions ahead of Saturday afternoon's matchup. NC State traveling out to Cal. It's a 3 30 kick against the Cal Bears. Both teams still winless in the ACC. Kenta, what are your thoughts here before we kick off? I think that these are two struggling teams. These are two teams trending in the wrong direction. These are teams that, you know, I would say Cal started off the season with some optimism, NC State not so much. But I would say both teams are are very much so losing fan enthusiasm and excitement as the days go by. With that in mind, we know what the law of the wolf states. When you expect the least, you get the most. I expected nothing against against Syracuse. I expected Syracuse to win by more than they did, I believe. I I believe I picked them to win by more than seven. I could be wrong, though. Yeah, you had him by – I think you had him up by 14. I had him winning by 14. Okay. And in this game, everything in me is telling me the law of the wolf shall prevail again, but I got to pick against them to, to get it there. But I'm going to stick true. I'm going to be true with it, and I'm going to play it straight up. I think NC State wins an ugly rock fight 20-14. to 14. I mentioned this on Thursday's show. I've been feeling all week this weird feeling that I could not shake, and it's been telling me that somehow NC State is going to win this ball game. The numbers would point you against it. The you know the way these teams currently feel right now would point you against it. We have a freshman quarterback going all the way out to California and playing one of surprisingly the better defenses in the ACC up until this point. Cal is very good in turnover margin. In fact, I think they're like second in the country. Is what I told you yesterday. NC State, in terms of turnover loss, is very close to last in the country. I think we're fifth to last in that department. Everything, like literally everything, would tell you. And, okay, and the fact that Cal is a 10.5 point favorite. Vegas, they typically know, but what do they know in this game? I haven't quite figured that out. For some reason, I think NC State's going to win this game. Much like Kenton was talking about, I don't know what it is. I think it's just Law of the Wolf. If you copy and paste the same effort, from Syracuse to Cal, but you erase the turnovers, that effort, I believe, is good enough to win this game. Now, that's probably a big ask because we've struggled with turnovers all season long. But if you can eliminate your turnovers and not beat yourself, I do think NC State is the more talented team in terms of roster, top-down offense and defense, and even special teams. I truly do think that NC State is more talented. Cal has probably been playing better, though. So what are we going to get on Saturday? I think NC State wins this game. I think it's going to be low scoring. It's going to be ugly. You're going to question if you want to keep watching, probably more than once. But I think NC State wins this game 23-20. to It's a close one. I think we narrowly escape. Everyone's going to ask, what just happened? How did we do that? But it happened. NC State picks up their first ACC win of the season, 23-20. to That'll do it for us here on Friday and for the week. Be sure to hit that like button if you have not already. Drop all of your comments in the comment box. Give us your final score predictions and any other thoughts you have surrounding Saturday afternoon's matchup. Hit that subscribe button if you have not already. And we will see you, I guess, what, Saturday evening by the time this game is over. Saturday evening for our post-game live following whatever does happen against Cal on Saturday afternoon. Be sure to join us on there as always. And until then, go Pack. Go Pack.